Most people are never exposed to real history. In school, we usually don't read history. We read history textbooks and mainstream ones at that which avoid underlying realities and ones that propagate myths, myths that serve the powers that be, myths that some of us find harmful to the truth and to democracy. So this is real history. This particular segment is entitled The Functions of Fascism. Fascism is a name that was given to the political movement that arose in Italy under the leadership of Benito Mussolini, who ruled that country from 1922 to 1943. Nazism, a similar movement led by Adolf Hitler, Germany's dictator from 1933 to 45, is considered by most observers to be a variant of fascism, as to a lesser degree is the militaristic government that controlled Japan from 1940 to 45 and the phalangist movement led by Francisco Franco in Spain when the fascists there, with the military aid, by the way, of the Italian and Nazi fascists, took over after a protracted civil war. Similar fascist or self-avowed fascist movements, but less successful ones, arose in Eastern Europe and in Great Britain, the United States, France, and other West industrial nations' movements. Some of them also came to power. Ladies and gentlemen, this great meeting is gathered here tonight to hear the policy and faith of fascism. Today, when the press is full of news about how Bulgaria or Romania or Hungary or Lithuania or Poland are returning to their democratic roots by overthrowing communism, we might recall that they weren't democratic before communism came in. They were fascist. I can boldly say that here and now the radical right is back. In fact, several of those countries, with the exception of Poland, were open allies of the Nazis. They were Nazi fascist allies. Now, like with a lot of terms like liberalism, democracy, socialism, communism, no single definition of fascism will satisfy everybody. And with fascism, there's a really special problem because it's a beguiling mix of revolutionary sounding mass appeals and reactionary class politics. And the reactionary class politics are the part of fascism that our establishment historians almost never talk about. Hitler's party, for instance, was called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP, or Nazis. It's a very left-sounding name, National Socialist German Workers, and it was designed to win broad support among working people, even while the Nazis were destroying working-class organizations. The original Italian and German variations of fascism was a political phenomenon that made a revolutionary appeal without making a revolution. It promised to solve the ills of the many while in fact protecting the special interests of the few with violence and terror. It propagated a new political consciousness, a new order, a new nation to serve the same old capitalist system. We want one we want that this people, we want one people, and you, my children, should learn this people. Let me run down a couple of the major characteristics of the fascist ideology. First, there is a glorification of the leadership cult the commitment to an absolutist and supreme leader, all-knowing, all-guiding, the Führer Prinzip, as it's called, the Führer Principle, the Leader Principle, I should say. Second, there's a glorification of the nation-state as an end in itself, as an entity unto itself, an absolute component, to which the individual is subsumed. Everything in the state, everything for the state, nothing outside of the state. That was Mussolini's dictum, and it was Hitler's also. Rudolf Hess once said, Adolf Hitler is Germany, Germany is Adolf Hitler, therefore combining both the leadership cult and the state cult in one. Third, there was a glorification of military conquest and jingoism. The glory of the state is vitalized by subduing, conquering, taking other people, enslaving them. You increase your own power and your own glory. Across the United States, Vera Kuhn has established 25 summer camps and drill grounds where those German-Americans who believe in Nazi teachings can imitate Hitler's mighty military machine. Fourth, there was the propagation of a folk mysticism, xenophobia, and a racism. The Nazi slogan was Eine Volk, Ein Reich, 
ein Führer. One people, one state, one leader. Also, other side of the folk mysticism and this blood cult of uh, the special blood, the special legacy, the atavistic wonders of our particular people was a hatred and racism, a hatred of other peoples, other nationalities. With the Nazis and with most other Eastern European fascists, it was anti-Semitism. The Jew was seen as the perpetrator of all that was ill in society. The trade unionists, they were Jews, the communists, so forth, so on. And behind them stood this wicked, alien-blooded creature who would undermine our state. Fifth, there was an opposition, both in Italian fascism and in German Nazism, an opposition to socialism, to communism, to anarchism, and to all left egalitarian class movements and doctrines, along with opposition to trade unions, opposition to labor parties, opposition to other working class political organizations. Of these various characteristics of Nazism, one, two, three, four are often talked about by established historians and mainstream historians. That last one, though, opposition to labor unions, opposition to working class parties, opposition to socialism and such, that one is never talked about by Western writers, especially American writers. The historians and the political scientists and the journalists who treat the subject of fascism usually write from a centrist ideological perspective, from the political center of the spectrum which means they usually ignore the link between fascism and capitalism, just as they tend to ignore the entire subject of capitalism itself when there's something unfavorable to say about it. Instead, they dwell on the more phantasmic components of fascist ideology, the nihilistic revolt against Western rationalism and individuality, the irrational appeals uh, to mass submission to a leader and all that. And fascism was those things, but along with its irrational appeals, it had rational functions. It was a rational instrument for class domination and for the preservation of the existing capitalist system. After World War I, Italy had a parliamentary government that seemed really incapable of solving the country's economic crises. Profits were declining, banks were failing, unemployment was rising. So to ensure profits, the big industrial giants and the big landowners would have to slash wages and raise prices. The state, in turn, would have to provide the big owners with tariff protections along with massive subsidies and tax exemptions. To finance this, the population would have to be taxed more heavily, their wages roll back, and social welfare expenditures drastically cut. It sounds like Reaganism? Well, it is, even more extremely so. But the government wasn't totally free to apply these harsh measures. First of all, Italian workers and peasants had their own unions, they had political organizations, they had cooperatives, they had their own publications, and through the use of demonstrations and strikes, boycotts, factory takeovers, the forcible occupation of farmlands, they often won some very real concessions in wages and work conditions, unemployment benefits, and they won the right to organize. And even in the face of this worsening economic crisis, they were able to mount a troublesome defense of their standard of living. I mean, troublesome for those who own the land, the labor, and the capital, and the money, and the banks, and the farms, and the factories. So the only solution really was to smash the worker and peasant organizations, in effect destroying all political and civil liberties, including the right to organize, agitate, and propagandize. The state would have to be more authoritarian and more firmly subservient to the interests of capital. Mussolini and his black shirts were around right after World War I, and for about three or four years, the big landowners and industrialists used their fascist goon squads, gave them money and gave them arms, and used them as kind of strike breakers, anti-labor militias. They styled themselves the united front against Bolshevism. In 1922, the big capital interests in Italy decided to go for the whole thing. Representatives of the Federation of Industry and the Federation of Agriculture, which was a agribusiness firm, and representatives of the National Banking Association, they all met together and they met with Mussolini and they planned the fascist march on Rome. Mussolini sat there and planned that with the leading capitalists of Italy. By the way, this is almost never mentioned in the accounts about the march on Rome. These big capitalists contributed 20 million lira toward that undertaking. In the words of Senator Ettore Conti, himself a very loyal representative of the moneyed interests, quote, Mussolini was the candidate of the plutocracy, that is of the wealthy, and the business associations. A very similar pattern, by the way, of coordination and compliance existed in Germany also, less than a decade later. 
German workers and farm laborers in the period following World War I under the Weimar Republic won some important economic concessions. They won an eight-hour day, they won unemployment insurance, they were able to elect shop committees, and they won the right to unionize. And again, during the 1920s, these paramilitary right-wing gangs, most notably Hitler's brown shirts, stormtroopers, were subsidized by business in a limited way and kept as a kind of reserve army, what Gurren called the bodyguard of capitalism. And their job again was to strike, break, and to harass organized workers and to beat up socialists and communists and such. The nearly total collapse of the German economy in 1929-30 presented the owning class with a momentous crisis. They had very big capital investments, and these left them with very high fixed costs that had to be met even as their plants lay idle. Only massive state aid could revive their profits. Wages and social welfare, human service expenditures had to be cut. Union contracts had to be abrogated. In fact, human contracts had to be abrogated too. Business would need new subsidies and tax exemptions. The crisis in agriculture was equally severe and the large landed proprietors, the Junker class, uh, demanded even higher subsidies, heavier duties on foreign agricultural import and the farm unions. These unions were holding wages up and when wages were being sustained, you cut into profits. So by 1930, most of the influential landowners and big industrialists and bankers, especially the industrialists in steel, coal, and mining, had concluded that the Weimar Republic no longer served their interests and no longer could protect their class, and that it was too accommodating to the working class and to certain sectors of light industry. So they greatly increased their subsidies to Hitler, and they propelled the Nazi party onto the national stage. By 1930, most of the great industrialists and bankers were underwriting the Nazi party. And what happened in 1930 with this injection of hundreds of millions of marks is that Hitler was able to catapult his party onto the national scene. It went from a cult of brown shirt thugs to a national party mobilized. In the election of 1930, the Nazi party gained 107 seats in the Reichstag. And Hitler later on, evoking the memory of what he called that astonishing campaign, told his listeners to think of, quote, what it means when a thousand speakers each has a car at his disposal and can hold in the year a hundred thousand meetings. And in 1931 and 32, the subsidies from the big industrialists continued to rein in ever more abundantly. So the Nazis were projected onto the national stage and they gained an ever larger presence in the Reichstag. Neither in Italy nor in Germany was revolution a real threat. The left was never strong enough to take state power in either of those countries. The threat wasn't really from the left. The bourgeoisie resorted to fascism less in response to the disturbances in the street and more in response to the disturbances in their own economic system. The threat wasn't from the left. The threat was from their own economic systems and its contradictions and the fact that democratic forces had developed enough democratic strength to resist the austerity and the rollback that the capitalists tried to impose to maintain their levels of profit. The sickness that these capitalists tried to banish was from within, not from without. The Italian and German monopolists, the big cartels, also had a direct interest in an expansionist military regime. They wanted a big rebuilding of the military, one that would, one, compensate for the decline in investment opportunities with huge armament contracts and related public works. In other words, this industrial and financial class wanted a large defense budget, as we would call it, because it was a source of capital investment and enormous capital profits. Does that sound familiar? Two, they wanted to embark on an aggressive foreign policy to open new markets for export and investment, thereby gaining a more equal footing with French and English competitors. So the fascists really became a very valuable ally against the capitalists' two worst enemies. The capitalists' two worst enemies are first the workers in their own country and the capitalists of foreign countries. And the genuineness, by the way, of fascism hatred of workers and foreigners was never open to doubt, so they fit in quite snugly. Now, I don't mean to say that all the big industrialists and financiers supported fascism with equal fervor. Some, like Tyson, were early and enthusiastic backers of Hitler. The aged Emil Kerdorf thanked God that he lived long enough to see the Fuhrer emerge as the savior of Germany. Others contributed money to the Nazis, but also to other anti-socialist parties on the right. They backed Hitler only when he promised to be the best hope for their interests. 
By the way, many of them still remained privately critical of the more extreme expressions of Nazi propaganda, and they were a little uneasy about the anti-bourgeois rhetoric that is sometimes used by some of the fascist plebeian elements. Some elements in business were not that hot for fascism. Light industry, which had lower fixed costs and more stable profits than heavy industry that was dependent on consumer buying power and such, the light industrialists were not that keen about a more aggressive foreign policy, about heavy subsidies to heavy industry and the like. But when push came to shove, they may not have been close to the fascists, but they weren't about to ally themselves with the proletariat against the business class of which they were a part, and they pretty much sided with the dominant elements or kept their mouths shut. There was another element in these two societies that not only tolerated the rise of fascism, but supported it. And I'm talking about the parliamentary capitalist state itself, not the government or the parliament as such, but the instruments of the state, the instruments that have the legal monopoly on force and violence, the police, the army, the courts, and the like, the secret intelligence agencies and such. In both Italy and Germany, years before Mussolini and Hitler emerged victorious, these elements, courts, police, the army, showed a real leniency and an open collaboration with fascism while harshly repressing the left. Mussolini and Hitler could not have come to power without the help of the state machinery, and that state machinery was never really against them. In Italy, the police collaborated with the fascists in attacking labor and peasant organizations. They recruited criminals for the fascist action squads, the squadristi, they call squadristi. They promised them immunity from prosecution for past crimes. When applications for gun permits were regularly denied to workers and peasants, police guns and police cars were made available to Mussolini's goons. Germany, the same kind of thing went on. Immediately after the war, the military police and the judiciary sided with the rightists to suppress the left, a pattern of collaboration that continued to the day that Hitler took power. In other words, these supposed democracies, which were equally opposed to totalitarianism of the left and the right, were not equally opposed. They were opposed to the left and they were very close and comfy with the right. Because the right, while it was out to destroy that democracy, the right was protecting the interests of property and the existing class structure. And that's the difference between the left and the right. And that's why a capitalist state tends to treat the right so much more leniently and the left so much more harshly. Let's look at what happened by the police and the courts under the Weimar Republic. These are the figures. Left-wing groups were charged with 22 murders. 38 people on the left were found guilty for those 28 murders. They averaged 15 years in prison. 10 of those 38 were executed. Among right-wing groups, 354 murders. That's about 60 times more the number of murders. Of these 354 murders, 326 were not even prosecuted. 23 people of the right-wing groups were discharged despite entering guilty pleas. They pleaded guilty to the murder and they were discharged. 24 were found guilty in part. Their average term in prison, four months. The number of them executed for the murders, none. So that's the way the state operated. Almost all the literature on fascism and Nazism concentrates on who supported Hitler, who supported Mussolini, who was behind him. Was it this group or that group and such? Oh, there was a couple of millionaires who didn't like them. Oh, there were some workers who did vote for them. So you can't really say it's one class or another. Well, I think you could pretty well say which class gave them the money that gave them the visibility of the organization and the numbers to some degree. But there's something else. Besides talking about who supported fascism, one thing these historians and political scientists never talk about is who did fascism support when fascism came into power? Who did the fascists support? Well, in Italy and Germany, when they came into power, they began implementing the stern measures that were needed to rescue the capitalist economy. Labor unions were dissolved, strikes were outlawed, union contracts were nullified, prominent union leaders and other labor activists were imprisoned or murdered, union property was confiscated, worker publications were banned, opposition political parties were outlawed, their leaders jailed, civil liberties were suspended, Fascist-sponsored unions, quote, unions were set up and their function was to speed up production, prevent wildcat strikes, and apply punitive regulations, including fines, dismissals, and imprisonments against workers who agitated or complained of shop conditions. I mean, even a Nazi labor front newspaper had to admit, quote, some shop regulations are reminiscent of penal codes. Workers no longer had the right to change jobs. They could be shifted from one employment to another regardless of their wishes. They could be conscripted for any work assumed useful to the nation's economy without guarantee of wages equal to previous earnings. In both Italy and Germany, the government exercised compulsory arbitration and regulation of work and wages. 
By the way, any worker who contested that would be contesting the laws of the state and therefore would be declared an enemy of the state, not just in conflict with management, but an enemy of the state. And so, in effect, what you got was a perfect wedding of the interests of the state and the interests of the capitalist class in this particular capitalist state. And by the way, these measures had their effect, according to figures supplied by the Italian press itself. The already meager wages, you know, the wages weren't all that good to begin with, for Italian workers in 1927 were cut in half by 1932. By 1939, the cost of living had risen 30%, and this constituted an additional decrease in real wages. Taxes on wages were introduced. Regulations were instated against minimum wages. The minimum wage law was abolished, in other words. There was no more increased pay for overtime. In some regions, sanitary and safety regulations were dropped. Occupational safety regulations were eliminated in factories. In many areas, child labor was reintroduced. In other words, all the old abuses and old evils that the Italians thought belonged to a generation ago had returned under fascism. In Germany, the same story. Between 1933 and 1935, wages were lowered anywhere from 25 to 40 percent. That's a tremendous cut if you're an ordinary worker just trying to make ends meet. Wage taxes were instituted. Municipal poll taxes were doubled. Payroll deductions helped finance the Nazi-controlled labor front. And the Nazi labor front controlled the party organizations and the health and unemployment insurances, all of which, by the way, lowered wages another 20 and 30 percent. That is, the things that were taken out of your pay for that. And the non-profit mutual assistance and insurance associations that had existed within the free labor unions that had been abolished when the Nazis came to power. Their funds were taken over by private insurance companies that charged more while paying out smaller benefits. In Germany, just like in, in Italy, inflation substantially added to the German workers' hardship. In the world-renowned Siemens factories, in the midst of its workmen, the Führer called the German people to work. And Berlin is working. There's something else both of these fascist leaders did. In both Italy and Germany, the process of privatization. Does that sound familiar? Ronald Reagan's dream. State-owned enterprises such as power plants, steel mills, banks, railways, insurance firms, steamship companies, and shipyards were handed over to private ownership for a song like gifts. Corporate taxes were reduced by half in both Italy and Germany. Does that sound familiar? Another Reagan achievement. Taxes on luxury items for the rich were cut, and inheritance taxes were either drastically lowered or abolished, just as they've been in the last 10 years in America. In Germany, between 1934 and 1940, the average net income of corporate businessmen rose by 46%. Enterprises that were floundering were refloated with state bonds. They were recapitalized out of the state treasury, and they were returned to private control when solvent. So you see, these are people who say socialism doesn't work, but when capitalist businesses start to fail, they go socialist. They take the money out of the public treasure and refloat these businesses. Does that sound familiar to you people who are worrying about the S&L bailout? We will create a financing corporation to issue, issue $50 billion in bonds to finance the cost of resolving failed institutions. Can you just tell me in absolute terms how much money do you need to survive? General Motors from today until March 30th. In the worst case scenario, the amount of money would be significant. I mean, we have, we have supplier What is significant, of $4 Mr. Or $5 billion dollars every month. Billions and billions of your tax dollars, money that was supposed to go towards paychecks so workers could keep their jobs. But according to a new study by a team of economists, 66 to 77 percent did not go to paychecks. Instead, most of the money ended up in the hands of business owners and shareholders. With numerous enterprises, the state guaranteed a return on the capital invested. They guaranteed a return and assumed all the risk of investment losses. So the rich investor didn't have to worry about any losses, and if his business didn't do well, he'd get the money from the state treasury. This is why the capitalists did like fascism. This, however, did not really bring a final solution. I mean, what the fascist state is, it attempts a final solution to the problem of class conflict. It obliterates the demands of the working class and the democratic forms that allow workers some room for an organized defense of their interests. But this final solution proves very far from final. In fascist Italy and Germany, industrial sabotage and sporadic wildcat strikes continued, inflation increased, whole sectors of the economy remained stagnant, there was widespread corruption, mismanagement, underemployment, vital social services deteriorated, but profits climbed. 
The profits went up, yes sir. The gestures made on behalf of the needy were pitiful. I mean, what the Nazis used to do is go around in the working class areas and collect alms, so they taxed the poor to give money to the still poorer, as Franz Schumann once said. It is compulsory to contribute once a month to the venture helper man, who collects relief money and food, which the family saved by serving a one-dish meal last Sunday. The Italian economy remained in a troubled, stagnant condition right up to the Second World War. In Germany, thanks to the booming armaments industry, the standard of living, at least most notably the unemployment problem, has been so bad as standard of living improved a little bit, but it never even reached 1928 levels under the Weimar Republic. So even under the Weimar Republic, for all its troubles, the levels of food, textile, and other areas of consumption and production were much better than ever achieved under Nazi Germany. Anyone interested in reading more about fascism, I would direct you to a very fine book by Daniel Gurin called Fascism and Big Business. The writings of Franz Neumann are also worth looking at. Now, my references, for a couple of occasions here, I've made references to Reagan and Reaganism. I didn't mean to imply that Reagan was a fascist. In fact, quite the opposite. I meant to point out that in the American context, Reaganism accomplished the same things within the existing framework of the political framework of the existing political system. He broke unions, but he didn't use death squads and terror squads. He broke them using advisory corporations spending hundreds of millions of dollars showing companies how to break unions. They broke unions by instituting one of the most restrictive and prohibitive and difficult laws, the Taft-Hartley law that goes back to 1940s, which make union organizing in America so very difficult. They've tried a number of times to limit our constitutional rights, the rights of free speech, the right of government accountability. They've cut inheritance taxes. They've cut the capital gains taxes. They've cut corporate taxes. They've abolished the progressive income tax. These are the accomplishments of the Ronald Reagan administration. While everyone talked about what a nitwit and a dingbat and a fool he was, Ronald Reagan did some very successful and brilliant things for his class. He rolled back the social democracy that had been developing in the late 60s and through the 70s. He cut back undermined human services. He staffed agencies and courts with people in government who do not believe in government and do not even carry out the programs that Congress voted in. So within the American context, he's done quite a few things short of, of course, what Hitler and Mussolini did as a final solution. And today I would also point out that in capitalist democracies in Western Europe and in the United States, the security forces have that same double standard that we discovered in Italy and in the Weimar Republic in Germany. Namely, they look the other way toward violence from the right or seem to do very little or seem seldom able to capture the perpetrators unless the perpetrators are so crazy as to attack and kill police themselves, then they go after them. But on the left, there's a constant surveillance, harassment, and in fact, sometimes outright murder. One can think of the systematic murder of the Black Panther Party, something like 30 of them killed in coordinated police attacks in cities throughout America. Or one can think of what's going on in West Germany, Italy, Belgium, Portugal today, where people on the left are being thrown in jail for astronomical sentences, while terrorists on the right seem to get by and get away with murder. Well, this is what we have to look at and we have to understand that fascism is not just another ism out there. It's not just an aberration. It has a very rational side to it. It's a rational, functional form and it can take diluted forms and its proclivities can exist even in the democratic state. That is, within that state, those police powers and those state powers can manifest some of the very same symptoms and all the worst attributes that you might find in a Nazi Germany or fascist Italy. Don't take my word for it, just ask the CIA. This is Michael Parenti with some real history. Thank you. Hi there, I'm EJ with Non-Compete. It has been quite some time since our last video. For those of you who've been subscribed for a while, uh, partly because the documentary you just saw took literally hundreds of hours of editing and research to get to the finish line. It took a lot of you know, digging to find photographs and footage that would reflect the actual history that Dr. Parenti was discussing. And we also hope that the annotations we added brought some depth to the story that was being told. Dr. Parenti did record three other real history lectures. We would love to give those the same full treatment as the one you just saw. The next one we'd like to do is on the myths of the founding fathers. And it's really great. You can listen to it right now online for free, but you know, we'd like to make it into a full 
documentary. So if you would like to support that, we do have a Give Butter uh, fundraiser. There's links to that in the description that you can contribute to, or of course you can support us on Comradery or Patreon if you're not already. Uh, and if you can't afford to donate, then that's totally fine. You could just subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it around, and maybe watch some other videos. If you did like the doc you just saw, then maybe you'd like the one we did on the industrial workers of the world and their radical anti-racist unionizing efforts in the turn of the last century. There's a link to that in the description as well. Uh, no matter what, thank you so much for your time. Stay safe and solidarity. We'll see you next time. After all its imperfections, America is still the beacon to the world, an ideal to be realized, a promise to be kept. There's nothing more important, nothing more sacred, nothing more American. That's our soul. That's who we truly are, and that's who we must always be. We're going to think big. We're going to make the 21st century another American century, because the world needs us to. That's where we need to focus our energy, not in the past, not on divisive culture wars, that for the next 200 years, we'll have what we had in the past 200 years, the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We just need to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. The United States of America. How do you propose to gain this freedom? By the only means left to us. Revolution. But it's doomed to failure. Perhaps. This time. And the next. Maybe. But you'll keep trying. We cannot be free until we have power. How else can we achieve it?